A highly anticipated event is taking place this afternoon in the north of Seoul, the capital of South Korea. A new kind of sporting event, as popular as a football World Cup. In front of the Olympic Stadium, the atmosphere is worthy of a science fiction film with superheroes and over 10,000 fans of all ages. They're all there to attend a national video game championship. This is known as eSport, and the inhabitants of this Asian country are passionate followers. There are several hundred professional players and millions of devoted fans. It's a very well-known game in Korea. There are clubs of fans like ours who go to all of the matches. I'm dressed as DJ Sona, one of the game's characters. She fights with a star-shaped weapon. She's very strong and beautiful, and she has big breasts, unlike me. Smed is one of the rising stars of this new sport. He's a star in Korea, where his popularity is similar to that of a European football player. At only 20, he's the captain of the Rocks Tigers, the super cool Tigers in English, one of the teams who have qualified for the national championship. I'm going to win. We have to beat them. You're going to win, son. <laughs> Smeb gave up his studies two years ago to devote himself to this online sport. Around him, family members encourage him. My son is very famous here, a real star of online gaming. People recognize him in the street. As a mother, I'm very proud of him. At the start, when he told me he was giving up his studies to become a professional player, I was worried and didn't agree. But as he was really motivated, I ended up letting him do it. Now he's successful. I think he did the right thing. For the family, the stakes are high. The winners of this final will take home 100,000 euros. But even more important are the sponsors. These young players are funded by big brands. On average, Smeb earns 60,000 euros, but if he wins, he can land new contracts worth hundreds of thousands of euros. So before the kickoff, he remains focused. We're playing a final game to stay on form. It's going to be great. I'm looking forward to it. We're going to win, I'm sure. I can already picture us lifting the trophy. More than just a sporting event, the competition is a live show broadcast on television and watched by millions of viewers. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the two teams for the grand final of the Korean Championship. And they're off for four hours of battle. The match takes place in three rounds, with each team made up of five players who compete armed with just a keyboard and a mouse in glass cages to isolate them from the noise. The spectators follow the action on these giant screens. The principle of the game is simple. The two teams each have an army of superheroes with superpowers. Combining agility and strategy, their aim is to destroy the opponent and conquer his territory. Eyes fixed on their son, Smeb's parents anxiously watch the score. Not now, I'm concentrating. They're a little tense, as it's not going too well for their son. After over three hours of competition, the two teams are at a draw with one set each. But the opponents of the super cool Tigers are very close to winning the final round. There are 30 seconds left to play and the Rocks Tigers are behind. If SKT wins, it will be their fifth victory in the final. It's over, it's over. SKT have won another victory for SKT. It's over. Their opponents take home the trophy and the 100,000 euros in winnings. 
for Smeb and all his fans, the dream is over. I'm sad my son played well, but I think that the other team was simply better. I hope that he'll win the next match. I'm still very proud of him. It's the third year in a row that Smeb and his team have to accept defeat in the final. But not all is lost. They leave with a check for 60,000 euros. Smeb still takes it badly. Honestly, I'm annoyed to have lost, but I'll give my all for the next match. The national championship may have to wait until next year, but in the meantime, the super cool Tigers will have other opportunities to stand out. In Seoul, there are several competitions like this every month, all as popular. Famous for its stars of K-pop who have spread their musical style and dances all over the world, South Korea is a small country in Asia between Japan, China, and its enemy brother in the north, one of the worst dictatorships on the planet. Its capital, Seoul, a megalopolis of 25 million inhabitants, is the showcase of this society, which is at the forefront of technology and innovation. With over 30 million mobile phones for 50 million inhabitants, it's the most connected country in the world and the world leader in smartphones. It's known for brands like Samsung, LG, or even Hyundai, multinationals that flood the planet with their products. At the forefront of robotics, Korea is inventing the society of tomorrow, an economic miracle, because 50 years ago, this Asian territory was one of the poorest on the planet. The secret of this success is the extreme spirit of competition that the country has cultivated. The pace of work is frantic at over 60 hours per week, one of the highest in the world. Exceptionally, we were allowed to film behind the scenes of one of the country's lead companies, POSCO, the Korean steel giant. This multinational demands unlimited devotion from its employees. And it's time for the POSCO motto. Employee dedication is the foundation of POSCO's success. POSCO is the best. To survive in this ultra-competitive society, Koreans are ready for anything. The latest trend is having plastic surgery to please employers and make the difference at job interviews. I've wanted to for a long time. I'm ready. I'm looking forward to it. Others pay fortunes to shamans to keep evil spirits away and ensure the smooth running of their businesses. And children are not spared in this pursuit of excellence. At just 15, Yunje is under incredible academic pressure. Between high school lessons and his evening classes, his days are over 15 hours long, a world record. Korean students finish their homework even if it's one or two in the morning. We don't have the choice. This is an investigation into South Korea, a small country on the leading edge who is determined to take on the bigger players. In Seoul, Korea's fascination with new technologies sometimes goes beyond the imaginable. Mr. Kwan is the head of a renowned cosmetic surgery clinic. He is rich, but rather discreet. The only display of his fortune is his impressive collection of cars, collector's items estimated at several thousand euros. But he agreed to show us something which is much more precious to him, his two slightly disobedient little dogs. Come on, get in. <laughs> Shendu 1 and Shendu 2 are so valuable because they are clones. Go on, Shendu, hurry up. Unthinkable in Europe, cloning of pets is totally legal in South Korea and perfectly accepted. Mr. Kwan's heart was broken a year ago by the death of Shendu, his precious poodle. So he called on science to bring him back to life. It was so uh, sad. I was so sad, and uh, I, I had no hesitation. The technology of duplication is maybe Korea is the, one of the first country, the best country. 
So I, I, I had no hesitation. This afternoon, Mr. Kwan is taking the two clones to the clinic where they were cloned. He wants them to have a checkup. In the suburbs of Seoul, this establishment has been cloning commercially for over 10 years and is unique in the world. Hello, hello, welcome. The practice is nevertheless reserved for an elite. To create an exact replica of a dog costs 80,000 euros. Hello. Hello. Here, the staff looks after their very privileged clients. No waiting, Mr. Kwan is immediately taken care of by the head veterinarian. His two five-month-old puppies aren't sick, but one of them can't open his right eye, and Mr. Kwan is a little worried. In your opinion, doctor, is this problem with the eye related to cloning, or did it happen at the delivery? Sometimes the eyes of a cloned dog do not develop well. I think that in a few years we will have to operate because the eye is degenerating and that can become problematic. It is a routine operation for the clinic, but that is not necessarily reassuring. Mr. Kwan has heard many rumors about cloning. I've heard about a cloned dog who was in perfect health until the age of five and then he started to get weaker and play less. Do you know the story? All I can say is that the first dog cloned in our clinic was born in 2007, and he's still doing very well today. In 10 years, more than 700 little clones have come out of this clinic. Customers come from all over the world. To duplicate their dog, there's no need to move. They simply send a skin or organ sample by mail. Technicians then extract the animal's DNA and inject it into a female's ovum and the animal is cloned. The success rate is 40 percent. Thank you. Goodbye. Mr. Kwan is relieved. Apart from this small problem with the eye, nothing abnormal. Before leaving, he wishes to thank the director of the clinic. Hello, how are you? <laughs> They've grown. <laughs> Dr. Wong is one of the pioneers of cloning. He is also a very controversial figure who was at the center of a scandal a few years ago after he published incorrect work on human cloning. Since then, he has refused to answer questions from journalists. Okay, okay, understood. But the cameras are welcome when it's good publicity. That day, a Chinese television channel is filming the cesarean delivery of the latest of the clinic's clones. The dog I am going to bring into the world will be the same breed as this one. Today he's a month old. Both dogs have the same genes. They are not brothers. They were cloned with the same genes. The show is well practiced, potentially a very good promotion for Dr. Wong. After South Korea, the scientist hopes to develop commercial cloning of animals in China. <laughs> In Seoul, wealthy individuals are not the only ones to utilize Dr. Wang's services. These German shepherds were ordered by the government and will soon join the Seoul police force. These are clones of Tracker. It's a very special dog to Americans in Pacific because it was the dog that rescued the very last survivor in the 9-11. Uh, incidents. And we here represent a good case in which science and the normal life of people have merged together so that we help people by the use of science. And these dogs will potentially one day be able to help people in sniffing out drugs, enforcing legislation, and helping to rescue people. However, nothing says that these dogs will perform well in the police force. They may have inherited the genes of an heroic German shepherd, but cloning does not pass on the character of the animal. Here, here, this way. Mr. Kwan has had this bitter experience himself. He is full of affection for his new Shendus, but is still in mourning. Every night he carries out the same ritual. Before going home, he spends two or three minutes at the tomb of his deceased pet to gather himself. I will have to clone again. Because the shape is same, but 
The brain and the heart is different. Outside is same, inside is different. Now I know the fact that I really loved the happy time and memory with the Chengdu, not the Sheikh. Unlike in European countries where there are serious ethical issues surrounding the cloning of animals, this issue is not even raised here, and the practice definitely has a future. Come on, follow me. South Korea is gambling on new technologies, and this race for progress has enabled it to go from an underdeveloped country to 11th in the ranking of the world's major economic powers in less than 50 years. A meteoric rise that the country also owes to its very particular work culture. Officially, Koreans spend 52 hours a week at the office, but they often do more than 60 hours, almost twice as many as the French. In Seoul, the capital, it is not unusual to see the offices still lit in the middle of the night. Exceptionally, a famous multinational opened their doors to us. It's 4 a.m. at the headquarters of Hyundai, the Korean automotive giant, and several employees are doing overtime. Chong Sang is responsible for communication, a profession that is not normally practiced at night, except in South Korea. As I work in marketing, I have to do a press review. I select articles and I post them on the company website. I get up early and work early, but I think I contribute to the good functioning of the company because I provide essential information. This morning, Chong is not the only one working, and others have spent the entire night in the office. In this rest room, a dozen employees catch up on lost sleep as best they can, lying on these benches or in these specially designed chairs. Here it is common and surprises nobody. I, mean, I really don't know why they were sleeping here. <laughs> Probably they came too early, so they needed somewhere to rest. Yeah, I don't know. Chong Sang finished his press review before the big rush of the morning, and he also finds a quiet moment to take a nap. For the well-being of its employees, the company has invested in luxury, state-of-the-art massaging chairs. When I work all night, I often come here to rest. These massage chairs really are very comfortable, and I'm grateful to my company for installing them for the employees. Today, Chong Sang is going to work more than 14 hours. Per week, he works more than 60 hours. As for holiday, he is only allowed 10 days a year, and it's somewhat frowned upon to take them all. This infernal pace was set in the 1960s to revive a country that had been ruined by the war. But recently the government is trying to reverse the trend because spending more time in the office is not synonymous with efficiency. Korean workers are among the least productive in developed countries. Hello. So for the past two years, Hyundai has been implementing publicity campaigns and American-style methods to streamline working hours. This morning, Chung Sang participates in a meeting with the director of his department. Among those taking part is a strange guest, this cube. This is the company's latest attempt to limit the length of meetings. You turn it on, then choose the length of the meeting. Five, 15 minutes, even an hour. Today it will be 30 minutes. And that's the time I'll need. It's a start, but old habits are hard to change. With or without a cube, meetings usually overrun and employees continue to work an unreasonable amount of overtime. And worse, in South Korea, the boundary between private and professional life is often blurred. And even after work, many employees spend more time with their colleagues than with their families. We head to Guangyang, an hour by plane from Seoul. It is here by the sea that POSCO, the fourth biggest steel producer in the world, has set up some of its factories. Five square kilometers dedicated to the metalworking industry, a city within a city the size of an average Parisian district constructed from scratch by the multinational. 
6,500 employees work there, entirely closed off from the world. The firm imposes an almost military discipline, almost completely opposite to the French model. It is 8 a.m. and their days all begin in the same way, with a gym session and slogans that glorify the company. And it's time for the POSCO motto. Employee dedication is the foundation of POSCO's success. POSCO will grow if all the employees respect the security rules. POSCO is the best. Tai Sung, a good soldier, has taken part in this ritual every day for 20 years. It is important to chant these slogans. It allows us to keep a morale of steel. Tai Sung is a laborer. He takes care of the maintenance of the machines. On average, he works 12 hours a day, and that's without counting the unpaid overtime. But here, this is normal, and the key word is devotion. And all day, the employees respect certain codes to show their dedication to the company. Most important is an extreme politeness. This morning, Tai Sung made an appointment with his spare parts supplier in order to identify a problem with a broken machine. Just change the remote control, the rest works. The matter is quickly resolved, but before leaving his supplier, Tai Sung doesn't hesitate in bowing to show his respect. This is compulsory in South Korea. When you meet someone for the first time, you have to bow, and then you offer your hand. It's the same with the elderly. With relatives or subordinates, you can greet them with a wave. But to greet superiors, you have to bow, to show respect. In South Korea, this is important etiquette. The second important rule to follow is respect for the hierarchy. In Korean companies, you cannot question decisions made by superiors, even if they are wrong. Everyone must stay in their place, and to remind employees of this, again, there are codes. Tai Sung and his colleagues have a meeting to take stock of the ongoing repairs. When they address one another, they do not use their first names but their titles, as they do in the army. Manager, how is it going with our supplier at the factory? There's a problem with the measurements. It will take three months to do everything again. Head of reporting, what should we do about safety standards? Head of planning called and set to ask the reporting assistant to assess them. In the eyes of the West, this protocol can seem comical, but in South Korea, it's very serious. Calling each other by our job title makes us all responsible. I think it is better for the efficiency of the team. The hierarchy is better respected. It's a little after 7 p.m. Tai Sung and his colleagues have dealt with all their urgent problems, so tonight there'll be no overtime and the employees can go home in peace. But leaving the office does not really mean leaving POSCO. The city that surrounds the factory belongs entirely to the multinational. The stadium, schools, houses, shopping centers, and even public transport. Everything was built by the steel giant. The conditions are ideal for us and our families. Everything we need is here. The company has planned everything for our well-being in this city and at the factory, which is good. It gives us more motivation to devote ourselves to our work. Tai Sung lives in this company's city, five minutes by road from his office with his wife and two children, a modest four-room apartment that they bought from the company for 55,000 euros. <laughs> Since we were married, my wife and I have lived here in the Posco village. We've never lived anywhere else, and we like this apartment. Tai Sung's wife is a stay-at-home mother. Together, they have lived here for 20 years. But the couple does not often have the opportunity to share many intimate moments because generally, Tai Sung stays late at the factory, and after work, he goes out with his colleagues. Tonight, he invited them to his home to celebrate the end of the school exams with his children. Good evening. 
Among the guests are a technician and his wife, and two wives whose husbands are still at the factory. I don't feel like we're doing overtime. Not at all. If we weren't here, we'd likely be in a bar having drinks. You know, our neighbors are also colleagues. We live together, we feel close. For me, it's not a problem. It seems clear to everybody, but Taisung and his colleagues push the boundaries even further. It's Friday night, the weekend, and they are off of work. But they've planned to take part in a charity event organized by the multinational tomorrow morning in a little village an hour's drive from the factory. Has everybody collected their tools? It looks like a normal work day, except it's Saturday. The POSCO employees are doing charity work for their company to help local farmers. We've come to repair their tractors on their iron gates. We've come to help because they are poor and can't afford to do it themselves. In South Korea, the economic boom has caused an exodus from the countryside. Many villages have been left empty and impoverished, so Taisung and his colleagues put their skills to work. Look at the space between the door and the wall. You see, it doesn't close properly. Let's fix that. It's good what POSCO are doing. The charity work is great advertising for the company, and it barely costs them anything. It's the POSCO workers who put their hand in their pockets to fund the operation. The employees all give 1% of our salaries towards the social activities of the business. With this money, we buy what we need to work, especially iron, which we buy from POSCO. It is true that our lives revolve around the business. I work and live in a POSCO apartment. I bring up my children here and I finished my studies here thanks to a grant from the company. So it's normal that I give them my free time. It's a fair exchange. This work mode has allowed South Korea to escape from underdevelopment. But today it shows its weaknesses. It has seen several financial crises, and for the first time, the country is experiencing unemployment. At only 3.7 percent, the rate remains low, but competition has become even more ruthless. In Seoul, many people find themselves excluded from the system, and the poverty there is now exposed. Granny, come on, have you already eaten or not? No, not yet. Do you want this rice cake? Yes, please. Choi is a pastor and for several years has been helping the most impoverished. Every Saturday, he organizes a soup kitchen in the northeast of the city. On the menu today is unsold food donated by local shopkeepers. Rice with peas, meat and sauce, fried tofu. Only take what you can eat, don't waste any. Probably the only meal that these needy men and women will eat all day. There are around 50 people wolfing down their lunches, faces turned to the wall in shame. There are people here who were directors of big companies, others who were university professors. They all lost everything in the financial crisis. But they were part of the development of the country. They've paid a lot of tax. But today, they're not recognized by the government, who want to hide all the misery in Korea and just abandons them. Most of those in need are elderly people. In South Korea, more than three million of them live below the poverty line. The main cause is the pension system, which was only put into place at the end of the 80s, and many people haven't contributed enough to earn a decent pension. 
Most of them live in abandoned districts like this one. Pastor Choi regularly visits them. When I don't hear from them for a while, I get worried and I wonder if they're still there, if they have a problem, if they've died. I'm always worried. He hasn't heard from one 60-year-old man who lives in this dilapidated building for several days. The pastor wants to check that everything is okay. Hello, is someone there? How are you? Have you eaten? No, I haven't eaten. Why haven't you eaten? I was lying down. You have to eat. I'm not going to come in. Do you like rice cakes? Yes, I do. There you go, eat those. A few years ago, Mr. Kim was a designer for an architect firm, but business wasn't booming. Today, he finds himself with no pension, and his only income is a minimal state aid of 300 euros a month. Not enough for decent accommodation. This five square meter room is all he can afford. When I sleep, I unfold a sheet on the floor as I'm ill, and I put the pillow between my knees, and then I lie down. In this box, Mr. Kim piles up his personal belongings, clothing, books, souvenirs, and a few appliances that he managed to keep from his old life. That's my computer. That's my TV. That's some childhood souvenirs. For the bathroom, you have to go on to the landing where Mr. Kim shares them with around 20 other tenants who live in similar conditions. That's the shower for everybody. Those are the old-style communal toilets. We're always told that Korea is an advanced country, but look for yourself, it's a scandal. The inequalities between rich and poor are enormous. Look after yourself, I'll see you soon. <laughs> the pastor has to leave. Others who have been left behind by society are waiting for him. 20 years ago, most pensioners lived with their children. But economic progress has changed people's mentalities, and the tradition no longer exists. Nowadays, many adults over 60 find themselves on their own, fending for themselves. To survive, they often need to work again. This grandmother is 81. Like all Korean pensioners, she receives aid from the state, but to improve her situation, she collects paper and cardboard that she finds in the streets to sell to the rubbish tip. I never thought I would end up like this. I worked my whole life as a cleaner, ironing. I did that for over 30 years, and now my legs hurt, but I don't have the choice. Four hours every day bent over collecting papers of pushing the cart is exhausting work. But Mrs. Choi hasn't found anything better. Her two adult children try to help her from time to time, but they aren't rich enough to provide for her. So tirelessly, she takes her bounty to the tip. For this first delivery, she earns around 10 euros. The price depends on the weight. How many kilograms do you have? 50 kilograms. That's good for me. The man at the tip always tells me that I'm not well and that I should stop, but I don't have much money and even if my hip hurts, I prefer to work than do nothing. On average, this work earns her 200 euros a month. Added to the 300 euros she gets from the government, this work allows her to live reasonably in this small two-room flat. But the pensioner is over 80 and worries every day how long she'll be able to keep going. 
I'm not happy. Often in the evenings I think about dying because life is too hard. I pray every night to not wake up. I can't wait to join God. Mrs. Choi's words reveal a sad reality. South Korea has the world record for the highest suicide rate. On average, 40 people kill themselves every day, twice as many as in France. In Seoul, the bridges are all under surveillance. To help potential suicides, lifesavers are on call 24 hours a day. But despite their efforts, the authorities struggle to contain the problem. Over the last few years, suicide is also affecting the young due to overwhelming pressure at school. In terms of education, South Korea is one of the best performing countries in the world. Its schools are among the best and its students attain the best results. A national pride. But this success comes at a high price, and young Koreans are also the most stressed in the world. It's 7 a.m. in a very stylish area of Gananam. Mrs. Park is preparing breakfast. But this morning, there's a problem. Her husband has already left for work, and she can't wake up Yunjae, her 16-year-old son. Wake up! Go on, wake up! Please, Mum, ten more minutes. The reason Yun Jae has so much trouble waking up is that he doesn't get much sleep. No more than five hours a night. An incredible rhythm for a growing teenager. The rest of the time he devotes to his studies. He dreams of going to a top university after he graduates. And to do that, he needs to be one of the best. Yun Jae, are you up? He's so tired he can't get up. Half an hour later, the young boy finally shows his face. But he's late, so no breakfast. He'll have to make do with a banana. Yeah. See you tonight. Bye. And his daily marathon begins. Over 15 hours of study every day from 8 a.m. to 1 a.m. A daunting schedule, unique in the world. First stage is high school, one of the best in Seoul. Here, the students wear uniforms. Boys and girls are in different classes, and discipline is strict. Every day, we have to leave our phones here. It's the rules. This morning is an economy lesson taught by this teacher. Even though the lesson is interesting, after a few minutes, some of the students are already crashing. Like Yunjae, they work long days so they catch up on their sleep as best they can. Yunjae is also falling asleep, so he decides to go to the back of the class where there's a high table put there to allow students to fight against fatigue. Standing up and without a chair, it's difficult to sleep. If I stay seated, I'm going to fall asleep, I know it. I've already had several warnings, and after three warnings, I'll lose points. So I do my best not to lose any more. <laughs> All of the students start the school year with 54 points, but the slightest error can cause them to lose points. Sleeping in class costs two points, and if you reach zero, it's expulsion. So everybody watches their step. The head teacher keeps count on his software, and he doesn't joke around with discipline. Okay. When I click on a name, I can find out everything about a student, especially if he has lost points. 
Look at Yun Jai, for example. He fell asleep yesterday, despite my warnings, so I was forced to take away two points. His mother immediately received a message, so she can lecture him when he comes home in the evening. It really is a good method for enforcing discipline. This system was put in place four years ago when the state banned corporal punishment within the school. But old habits die hard, and students making noise in the corridors should watch out. It's 4 p.m. and the end of the school day, but Yun Jae's daily marathon continues. After more than seven hours in high school, he now has five hours of private lessons. I'd like to go and rest, but the day isn't over for me. And he mustn't hang around because his mother is waiting to drive him to a private academy. It's a school who gives intensive lessons. In Seoul, 90% of students go to these establishments after their classes. South Korea is a small country and we don't have many natural resources. Our wealth is our brains, so we invest in the education of our children. It's our most precious resource. Hi, Mom. The lessons he is taking tonight cost Yun Jae's parents 900 euros a month. It's expensive, but in South Korea, you can't put a price on education. For five hours, the young boy will carry out mathematics exercises, not with the aim of improving his weaknesses, but to get ahead in the school curriculum. In Seoul alone, there are more than 30,000 establishments like this one, a parallel education system that is designed to ensure success. Goodbye, see you tomorrow. 10 p.m., and Yun Jae can finally go home. Before leaving, he has to punch out like at the factory so his parents know he isn't missing lessons. Um, very... Good. Uh, now I can go home and take a shower. And I can go to bed. Every evening between 10 and 11 p.m., thousands of school children like him are leaving these academies, a surprising spectacle in the streets of the capital. But what is most incredible is that after 12 hours in a classroom, Yun Jae still hasn't done his homework. Before going to bed, his last stop is in the study room of his building. Many buildings have rooms like this for students to work in peace. I'm really tired now, but, you know, it's my homework and I have to do. It can be 1 a.m. and 2 a.m., but, but we have to do because that's our job. It's past midnight, and the young boy finally pushes open the door of his apartment. Mom, I'm home. His mother has prepared him a last meal. His father still isn't home from work. Here you go, Yun Jae. Did you have a good day? Bon appétit. Yun Jae keeps up this infernal rhythm every day. His mother is aware of the shortcomings of the Korean education system, but she doesn't see any other alternative. Of course I worry about my son. He works a lot and has very little free time. But as long as he can, he has to continue. Korean society is very competitive. We worry about our children's future. They have to work hard to get every chance on their side. Tonight, once again, Yun Jae will go to bed exhausted at 1 a.m. The authorities try to battle against the educational frenzy of children and their parents by limiting the opening hours of private academies, but it's a losing battle. The beginnings of unemployment has raised tensions in the job market, and to make it, young Koreans are ready to do anything. The latest trend is to have cosmetic surgery to improve your appearance and please employers. 
In just a few years, South Korea has become the kingdom of the scalpel, ahead of Brazil or the United States. And it's common to come across people in the streets who are just out of surgery. Watch out for the pavement. A sculpted chin, a pointed nose, or an enlarged smile. Here, anything is possible, even the most improbable, like having Botox injected into your vocal cords to have a more beautiful voice. He's going to have a deeper, more serious voice, and it will reduce tremors. All over the capital are adverts highlighting the skills of these surgeons. Even photo booths have given in to this quest for perfection. As surprising as it may seem, for many people, going under the knife isn't just a question of vanity, but also a factor in your social standing. Okay. Bye, see you next time. 28 years old, Hayua has a degree in communication. When he finished his studies three years ago, he thought he would find a job easily. But after sending out many CVs and attending many interviews, he's had no luck and he is convinced that his looks are the reason. When I call back employers to find out why I wasn't hired, I'm told, you're too skinny, your face is too thin, your eyes are too small. My appearance counts against me. I don't think I give a good impression. In short, they let me know that I don't match the image of their company. And in the end, I'm rejected because of the way I look. Hayua would like to work in the marketing department of a big fashion company. So, to improve his chances with the recruiter, he decides to get his eyes enlarged. A decision that may seem extreme, but in such an ultra-competitive society, this cult of appearance has become the norm. Many recruiters admit that the looks of the candidates is a determining factor in their decision. Some go as far as requesting detailed information on their future recruits' bodies. These are all the CVs that I've sent and the documents I've had to provide. A company once asked me for a medical certificate to say I was in good health. This document shows all the details of my body, the size of my chest, my thighs, all the specifics of my anatomy are there. I gave them this document at the interview, but I wasn't hired. In desperation, Hayue booked an appointment in one of the many clinics in Gangnam, the most exclusive area in Seoul. There are over 500 here, Hayua chooses one of the most well-known. It spreads over 16 floors, and nine doctors work here, each with their own specialty. Here the staff are in tune with current standards of beauty. Hello. Hello, doctor. Hayua is going to be operated on by Dr. Dao, specialist in eye enlargement. Look in the mirror. You have skin that hides your eyelids. The fold of the skin pushes the eyelids down for an Asian. You don't necessarily have small eyes, but we can correct the form and remove the skin. In South Korea, this is the most popular procedure, especially with women who dream of having a face that is more Western-looking. But Dr. Dao also operates on a lot of men, around 15% of his clientele, and the majority of them go under the knife for professional reasons. I'm not surprised because competition in the professional world in Korea is fierce. There's a lot of unemployment, so for men who have problems with their appearance, it's harder. Everybody wants to stand out, even if it's just the little details. The operation costs 1,500 euros, which is a considerable sum. But for Hayue, it's worth the investment. It may be his ticket, finally, to the working world. I've wanted to for a long time. I'm ready. I'm looking forward to it. The operation only takes a quarter of an hour and is carried out under local anesthetic. For Dr. Dao, it's routine. He carries out between 6 and 12 operations like this every day. In the recovery room, Hayua is impatient to see his new face, but he's going to have to wait a little. 
Now my eyes have to scar well. I need to take care of them. But I really think it could change my life. Four more weeks of waiting, a final visit to the clinic to remove his stitches, and then maybe, finally, the job of his dreams. Faced with increasing social and economic pressures, Koreans are experiencing a growing unease, and in this majority Christian country, more and more are finding comfort in faith. This morning, away from the eyes of onlookers in the highest parts of Seoul, a somewhat special ceremony is taking place. A shamanic ritual, an ancient spiritual practice aiming to communicate with the spirits. Behind the scenes, the leader of this joyful group is concentrating before the arrival of his next client. His name is Gimpa, and he's a professional shaman. A former singer, he discovered his vocation around 20 years ago. Since then, he's been carrying out religious rites to communicate with gods and nature, and his business earns him a lot of money. Everybody is trying in life, but it doesn't always go the way you would like. People come here to find a meaning to their lives thanks to the power of our ancestors and gods. It's especially young people who are discovering shamanism. Among his clients are stars, sports players, and more and more often, businessmen. This morning, Gimpa is meeting an important client who made his fortune in wealth management. The millionaire is close to the government, so the shaman greets him in person. Hello. Hello. It's been nearly a year since we've seen each other, hasn't it? Yes, that's right. You came last year. The man is a regular here, but he prefers to remain anonymous because paying a shaman to make your business successful is considered taboo. I came to pray and to ask the spirits to protect my business and my employees, to keep them in good health so business goes well. To fulfill this personality's wishes, the shaman has prepared a whole program. To begin, the ritual of cutting straw. A well-known ceremony amongst his followers, in traditional costume, barefoot on this sharpened blade, Gimpa dances himself into a trance and invokes the deities. The gods of the sea and of the mountain and all the other gods say things have changed since last year. In the front row, the businessman doesn't miss a moment. Though it should be said that he's paid a considerable amount of money for the services of Gimpa and his team, nearly 20,000 euros, and that's not all. To receive favors from the gods, you have to offer more and more gifts in cash. In the hut next door, the shaman's co-workers are preparing another ritual, sacrificing a pig. The animal was killed the night before, and its death is supposed to keep illness away from the businessman and his company. But for that, the gods must be given the equivalent of 50 euros. Do you have 30,000 won? Yes. An offering doused in rice alcohol, which will end up in the shaman's pockets. Spit three times and afterwards you can leave, but don't turn around as you're leaving. It may seem barbaric, but with this kind of ritual, the businessman believes he is keeping away the evil eye. At the beginning, it scared me. I was uncomfortable, but I watched, learned, and understood. And once you understand the meaning of things, you end up accepting them. It's obvious, even. The ceremonies will go on all day. For each dance, Gimpa changes his outfit and his client increases his offerings. In total, on top of the 20,000 euros that it cost to book the ceremony, he'll spend 3,000 more. 
An avalanche of money that seems to amuse the shaman and the spirit that he seems to be channeling. I have money, money everywhere. We're going to have fun. I feel the spirit of grandfather waiting for me. At that price, the businessman at least gets a good meal. Even if the cost is exorbitant, the businessman is firmly convinced it works. One day, I negotiated a contract with a new company that I don't know. The shaman told me to be careful and pay attention to certain details of the contract, and that saved me. I avoided catastrophe. On average, Gimpa carries out around 50 of these ceremonies each year, enough to earn a pretty sum. And his business has a future. There are more and more believers in the country. Every year, 40% of South Koreans consult a shaman. A few kilometers away in Seoul Station, Hayua, the young job seeker who had his eyes operated on, is in a hurry. This is the moment he's been waiting for for a month, to get a new photo for his CV. And he's banking on his new face to revive his job search. My face is softer. I'm still the same, but today I have a better physique, and I think that will go down much better with people. The difference isn't necessarily obvious, but at least this cosmetic surgery has given him more self-confidence. With his new face on his CV, Hayua is convinced that he will land the job of his dreams in the marketing department of a big company. Before the operation, when I had more slanting eyes, People didn't think I was friendly. I've even been told that I wasn't getting a job because of my looks. Today, my eyes are bigger, and I can look people more easily in the eyes. I think people trust me more now, which is important, and can make all the difference to a recruiter. Since the end of our filming three months ago, Hayua still hasn't got the job that he desperately wants. But it's only a matter of time. With growth at nearly 3%, South Korea is one of the most dynamic countries in Asia and one of the most innovative on the planet. <laughs>